Joseph Anson, ah, thank you for being here. Joseph Anderson es un compositor con un interés particular en el desarrollo de una práctica de espacio musical de composición y ejecución del sonido. Su trabajo se enfoca en la música cosmática creada a través de herramientas autocreadas y algoritmos de procesamiento de señal. Es el autor principal del Ambisonic Toolkit que ofrece muchas de estas técnicas especiales, espaciales avanzadas a un público más amplio de artistas y compositores. Como ex miembro del Teatro del Sonido Electroacústico de Birmingham, en, eh, en Gran Bretaña, Anderson creó el colectivo de música de cinta de San Francisco con Matt Ingalls para llevar la práctica de la difusión del sonido de las actuaciones públicas en el área de la Bahía de San Francisco. Y a través de este lugar, Anderson continuó programando y actuando en el Festival de Música de Cinta de San Francisco. Los reconocimientos por su esfuerzo de composición han incluido el Gran Prix del Concurso de Música Electroacústica de Burgos de 1997 para la música de cambio. Después de haber trabajado en una amplia variedad de contextos, Anderson tiene experiencia tanto en la industria como en la academia. Ha trabajado como ingeniero de procesamiento de señal en Silicon Valley para Analog Devices y en Reino Unido como profesor de la Universidad de Hull y de la Universidad de Kent. Anderson estudió música, informa y música informática con Russell Pinkston en la Universidad de Texas y completó estudios de posgrado en composición musical y un doctorado con John T. Harrison en la Universidad de Birmingham en Reino Unido. So, Jun, thank you very much. The space is yours. <coughs> okay, so, um, yeah, I guess I... How oh, do we... No. D did we run? Okay. Um, yeah, so, uh, thank you. And um, I guess I'd like to start by uh, taking the... Um, Uh, opportunity to uh, thank the organizers of this colloquium uh, for inviting me here. It's nice to have the chance to speak. Um, now, the title uh, in the program, at least the one I have, the question mark isn't there, um, but in my the full title, why Ambisonics was with a question mark. And uh, <coughs> yeah, that's It can be a blank screen, yeah, so there's no slides. Um, so the the question really is as much for me as for you, and I'm not really presenting this as why you should be uh, get into ambisonics and become uh, what some might call me an ambisonic nutter, that is spending all my time thinking in a certain way and thinking about sound. Um, so really this uh, talk is really framed a, uh, around how I came to think in the way that I do, which ends up shaping uh, the tools that I make, um, which allows us to work with Amazonic sound. Um, yeah, so keep that in mind. It, I consider this really a way of thinking. Um, so I th I'll probably have to apologize in advance that I'm going to try to cover too many topics and probably not have enough time to do justice to any of them and be a bit too vague. Uh, so apologies in, in advance for that. But the rough outline of things I'm going to touch on is, first I'd like to give some sense about why I'm here as a composer and um, what makes uh, make me, makes uh, me think the way that I do. And I'll frame that in a discussion um, that could be a sub-discussion that could be titled The British Acousmatics and How I Became One. Um, and then given some sense of acousmatic thinking, in quotes, I'll touch on some background into ambisonics uh, with the, uh, how this technique um, offers uh, what resources uh, and tools to the composer. Um, so the Amazonic Toolkit is a specific example of that. And then um, also add in some of my more recent thinking on space and uh, some interesting technical opportunities that may result from these other ways of thinking. I have some sound files to play, and uh, if we start running out of time, I'll just... Uh, we'll jump straight to that because those examples will um, hopefully uh, 
provide some kind of answers or experience about what I'm trying to talk about. Okay, so if we start with the British acousmatics, um, and in particular thinking what space and immersivity has meant to that group of composers, um, it might help uh, to think, uh, well, identify who those people are and what are some of the ways they're thinking. Um, and I'm assuming that not everyone here is a composer and that, um, so for myself, I do uh, consider myself an inductee into the tradition of British acousmatics. Um, and I'll go ahead and propose a few composers' names about who, who might these people be. So I'll raise Trevor Wishart, uh, Dennis Smalley, and John T. Harrison. Uh, Trevor Wishart um, is well known for his book on sonic art. Um, so that's considered one of the foundation documents. Uh, Dennis Smalley has a really well-known um, essay called Spectromorphology and Structure and Processes. It's really a discussion about how to think about composing with sounds outside a tonal system. Um, and from Harrison, I'll... Um, yeah, I can just go to a blank if that's... Uh, for Harrison, I'll um, go ahead and uh, start with uh, one of his pieces, which is um, titled Imaginary Space, Spaces in the Imagination. Uh, so here he gives us a good uh, way of describing what he means uh, by acousmatic and helps give, give us a sense about the acousmatic uh, tradition as described by British composers. Um, so I'll go ahead and start with a quote. So he's, he, he states, in its most basic form, acousmatic is an adjective which can be applied to music in which the source or cause of the sound is not seen. So acousmatic listening, um, we don't see uh, what is creating the sound. So that could be behind uh, loudspeakers or it could be behind a curtain. Um, in our age, it's music for loudspeakers. Uh, immediately, the question this raises other questions, as the listening situation might well be described as acousmatic. Uh, so even though what is being heard may not have originally been intended for this kind of reception. So obvious examples from popular culture include Muzak in restaurants or shopping malls, uh, chamber music broadcast on radio or CD and most popular music. So acousmatic listening is not a unique thing to the, the British acousmatic tradition or uh, what we uh, will describe as uh, acousmatic composition. The situation alone is therefore not enough to define acousmatic music. There needs to be an acousmatic intent on part of the composer. This suggests an aesthetic stance, though this should not be confused with the frequently voiced assertion that acousmatic music is a style. Okay, so what Harrison is pointing out that acousmatic listening circumstance alone or listening to music from behind loudspeakers doesn't make acousmatic music um, in quotes. Uh, so we should also note that both the composer and the listener are somehow involved. So the listener uh, has to be, is in on this kind of transaction here. Uh, so uh, Harrison continues, acousmatic music on the whole continues the tradition of music concrete. So this is Pierre Schaeffer's music concrete and has inherited many of its concerns. It admits any sound as potential compositional material frequently refers to acoustic phenomena and situations from everyday life, and most fundamentally of all relies upon perceptual realities rather than conceptual speculation to unlock the potential for musical discourse and structure in, from the inherent properties of the sound objects themselves and the arbitrator of the process of the ear is the ear. So that's really quite a long detailed uh, statement, but it, um, gives us, I'll pull out a few things from there. Uh, so pretty important, I would say, is continuing the traditions of music concrete. 
so the British acousmatic uh, tradition considers itself as having grown out of that. Uh, the practitioners uh, view their work as inheriting and extending the model set out by Pierre Schaeffer and uh, the Groupe de Recherche uh, Musicale, so GRM, uh, well known. Also, by admitting any sound as musical material and regarding uh, acoustic phenomena from an ev everyday life and further perceptual realities as subject matters suggests an important role for sound recording uh, and reproduction. So Harrison doesn't directly say that, but um, I've said it. Uh, so we should also note that considering features of these recordings is of interest to the composer of acousmatic music. Okay, so uh, s step one, we have sound recordings they may, uh, sound is played from behind uh, loudspeakers, the features of those recordings become the basis of me the musical com composition. So the composer starts with the sound rather than starting with an idea about the sound. So a rough summary of that. Okay, so sound recording, carrying on thinking about uh, sound recording as part of the tradition, if we're interested in space and immersivity, we're likely to be interested in recording techniques able to somehow capture these features. Uh, so I'll raise the uh, possibly contentious notion of fidelity here. Uh, that is a faithfulness to the acoustic phenomena from everyday life in question. Uh, so being explicit, we shouldn't be surprised for the composer of acousmatic music to be interested in recording techniques capable of faithfully, and I put that in quotes, capturing a subject sound's spatial aspects. Uh, so we'll use that, um, uh, expand on some of that a bit later. Okay, so next up is the acousmatic image um, and faithfulness as a question. Um, so Daniel uh, Berriello presents an interesting discussion on uh, what he calls the sonic image in the acousmatic uh, tradition. So his short definition of the sonic image is this. Mental representations motivated by sonic stimuli that reach the listener in an acousmatic listening situation. So that's pretty short. Um, you're listening without seeing mental representations are created, they've been motivated by that sound, that stimulation. Uh, he has a much longer summary of his broad discussion. Um, so I'll just jump straight to that. So he uh, states, sonic images derive from the interplay of many aspects related not only to the characteristics of the sounds, uh, possible references to pl plausible or imagined sources, gestures that may have caused the sounds, the way different sound material are integrated in the musical discourse, the listener's experience and perceptual habits, amongst other issues. Uh, so that, that's really quite long, um, which he's talking about pointing uh, the listener pointing out and pointing in. Um, and uh, he'd, it's, a, it's a nice piece of work. He reviews a number of different authors, uh, but he ends up uh, reducing a number of concepts into what he describes as intrinsic and uh, extrinsic. Uh, and uh, this will useful, be useful for uh, uh, our discussion here. So intrinsic uh, aspects um, he describes as being related to the inner characteristics of sounds as they are, uh, therefore accessed through uh, Schaefer's reduced listening, that is your listening without knowing the cause or um, any kind of social meaning whatsoever. Um, and they are not dependent upon the identification of the sources that cause the sounds or possible meanings otherwise conveyed. Extrinsic aspects are, uh, on the other hand, connotations, meanings, and references that lay outside the sounds themselves. 
uh, and can be related to human experience in the broader sense, including domains other than uh, sonic. Um, so the intrinsicness of the sound or those aspects are contained in the sounds themselves, extrinsic are our relation or understanding of those sounds. Um, an example I used with my students in the UK, uh, I had a recording of coyotes. Um, I always found that to be very relaxing. Uh, I grew up in Albuquerque, coyotes howled when I was in bed. So it meant I was in bed and the coyotes were doing their thing. Uh, to the students, it w meant the sound of horror. It was a frightful experience and they always had anxiety about it. That shows that we can have the same sound, but two different extrinsic meanings. I know I'm right. Coyotes are a nice thing. <laughs> so if we choose to speak of the spatial aspects of sound objects, acousmatic music's fundamental me uh, musical meaning, I think it's safe to say that um, we c these are just uh, consist of both extrinsic and extrinsic details. Uh, we might ex suggest that the intrinsic could possibly be objective and the extrinsic be subjective. Um, in other words, it uh, may be possible to measure somehow extrinsic, intrinsic aspects. So returning to Harrison, that acoustic phenomena may become compositional material, uh, the faithful capture of intrinsic uh, nature of sound becomes important to unlock the possibility for musical discourse. So I'm kind of just repeating uh, what Harrison said, but adding that this in the intrinsic features are what uh, one of the things that can allow this, uh, the music to be created itself and the structure to be created itself. So to say this simply, um, when we consider uh, the spa intrinsic spatial aspects, uh, if we can capture that or be interested in capturing that, those features, we should expect we can build musical structures and musical meanings with that. Okay, so that was a long way of saying uh, if we're acousmatic composers, uh, we should be interested in uh, capturing the uh, spatial aspects of sound so we can use them to build compositions. Um, and uh, hopefully that will become apparent uh, in um, some of my work that will be presented in concert um, and through some of these sound examples later. Um, a little bit of how I got here, how I became a British acousmatic. Uh, well, um, part of that involved hearing um, one of Harrison's pieces um, titled Ed Ancy de Sweet um, and experiencing the practice of stereo sound diffusion. Um, so stereo sound diffusion we can describe as the por performance practice of the British acousmatic tradition. Um, uh, I ended up experiencing that through a visit from Stephen Montague um, in 1992. Um, and I'll skip that bit. Uh, well, I'll add a little bit of detail anyway. Um, Montague uh, states that the British really learned to uh, do sound diffusion from the early 80s um, after interaction uh, with um, composers and concerts and residencies at both IRCAM and GRM, uh, both in Paris. Um, okay, so Back to Ed Ancy de Sweet. This is one of the first pieces that I heard uh, that jumped out at me, the, the crafted nature of a stereo sound image. Um, so in particular, um, the intrinsic spatial aspects of, spatial, uh, of Harrison sound material 
um, it became apparent to me that they uh, were foundational in the discourse and meaning of the piece. Um, so my first reaction was really, how did he do that? How did he get such interesting uh, stereo image uh, spatial aspects? The part of that uh, answer is really starting with interesting sounds and then recording in stereo. So that seems kind of like an obvious duh thing, uh, but this is on my early path in the early 90s um, before I realized that, and apparently many people around me also didn't realize that. Uh, but using some earlier language, uh, the stereo microphones were being used to uh, catch the intrinsic uh, nature uh, of the sound material itself so the, and the spatial aspects. Okay. So I'm going to give a, um, uh, rather than go into detail about the um, performance practice of sound diffusion, I'll just kind of summarize it as uh, like a main pair becomes the uh, main subject. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you have a, one pair that's that's named main, and that that acts like a, a soloist pair on stage. Uh, another pair, for instance, is named distance. Um, another pair named rear. Another pair named punch. Uh, so these loudspeakers are in different places in the hall and the performer uh, chooses to uh, diffuse, in quotes, the sound to those different loudspeakers, uh, reinforcing the, uh, both the spatial uh, structure and the dramatic structure of the piece. So for instance, if you have, have uh, solo sound material, you usually would start on the, on the stage if you have something a sound world that begins to uh, become immersive and take over, you bring up all the loudspeakers. Uh, so this is done in real time in performance. That's the uh, classic uh, tradition. Uh, but the big takeaway there is different loudspeakers sound different in different places in a space. And we can use that as a, uh, to create meaning in performance, in a spatial performance. Uh, we can also go backwards from that and think about placing microphones in different place to capture sound. And it may be the same sound, but the different placement of the, of the microphones uh, with the subject sound will give us a different uh, spatial meaning to that sound. Um, Okay, um, a very uh, brief overview of ambisonics. Um, uh, the short answer, I would say, is that ambisonics really came out of um, Michael Gerzon's interest in making uh, sound recordings uh, and making faithful sound recordings. Um, so ambisonics uh, started with a way to capture um, uh, concerts and musical performances in a faithful way. Uh, so the microphone that Gerzon developed included four microphone capsules to capture, uh, make a 3D recording. Uh, then, of course, it was realized that those four microphone capsules in a tetrahedron could be played back in a tetrahedron, and you could re reproduce that experience of sound at where the microphone was placed. Uh, further um, development happened uh, where it was realized that uh, virtual microphone feeds could be developed from that core and uh, instead of feeding just a tetrahedron of microphone uh, of uh, loudspeakers, we could choose an, 
to feed an arbitrary array of loudspeakers with uh, virtual microphone feeds made from that uh, original uh, recording. Uh, so to get into to ambisonics itself, uh, probably the big leap is when that microphone signal was um, not left as the single channel feeds, but uh, turned into something called B format. Uh, B format um, obviously is between A format and C format. A format is what was called off the microphone. B format is a uh, resampling um, of those microphone feeds in the spherical domain. Uh, so the A format's the angular domain, that's directions that you look, or you, I think of it as slicing up a pie. Uh, B format is in the spherical domain, it's uh, a kind of spatial description of that. Um, technically, you do the um, Fourier transform over a sphere, and that's what you get. Okay, so another uh, really ambisonics broke the connection between microphone feeds and loudspeaker feeds. And we can describe that as breaking uh, the panning law to an encode stage and a decode stage. Once you're in that intermediate space, that B format, uh, it turns out uh, many opportunities arrive. Uh, and this is where imaging or shaping of the uh, spatial domain can happen. And this, uh, this shaping is called spatial transforms. Uh, and this is, these are filters acting on space. Uh, some simple ones are rotation, so we can rotate the presentation in the sound field, but we can do other things as well, including warping, taking things out, emphasizing parts of the sound field, and so on. Uh, so, as you can imagine, once you start thinking in this way, then the spatial aspects just become another uh, element that you can touch in some of the same ways that we touch other elements, um, like the frequency domain. Uh, so there's some, some correlations and some things that are very similar, but we're working on space rather than um, frequency. Uh, so the Ambisonic Toolkit is really just gathering all these, many of these things all in one place. Um, uh, and um, I would really describe it as a way of thinking about the sound field as the place that you act uh, on, that you're acting in terms of uh, shaping the spatial domain. Okay, so let's quickly jump to my new way of thinking. Um, let's see, where is it? There we go. Okay, the, the new way uh, of thinking um, that I've just recently um, directed my attention to is kind of rethinking what the spatial domain or how to touch the spatial domain. Um, and this uh, I call this Heiserian analysis after Richard Heiser. So um, he had the, um, he was someone who was interested in measuring loudspeakers. Uh, and he ended up presenting uh, some really useful measures that you can do that describe uh, space itself um, from something called um, specific acoustic admittance a word, you know, a set of words I'd never heard before. Um, but this is a, a bit more kind of profound way of uh, addressing space. So, um, and it's something that we can actually see and measure in an objective way. Uh, and we can see things like direction, distance, and, and um, how reverberant the sound is. Uh, and uh, on the analysis side, but given a synthesis side, we can also synthesize these Heiserian features. Um, uh, and these are really the intrinsic aspects, the uh, spatial aspects of a sound. So that's one of the things that really, uh, really excites, excites me about that. So uh, kind of vague there, uh, 
this is kind of a new thing. There are some people working in this domain at the moment uh, with sound field upsampling. Uh, so Harpex and the Compass plugins use this view, but there's a lot more interesting things that can come our way exploiting this Hyzerian view in another way. Okay, so uh, that's why I do ambisonic. So let's let's jump to some sound examples too. Um, I'll just drop this down and get set up. This uh, first example is um, just, it's, uh, it's the ocean recorded from three different distances. So it's the exact same thing. Um, and if, when we start playing this, make sure it's played loud enough that people can hear it. Um, but making, making the point that uh, the spatial aspects of the sound are important. So can you bring the gain up? OK, this is the ocean far away. I don't know, are you hearing it? Do you need me to bring things up? OK, there we go. Okay, that's a midfield view, and this is a near field. View. Okay, so ho hopefully everyone noticed that it was different. Um, if we, that's the it's the same subject. The microphone is just in different places. Uh, this display here is a, showing a frequency-based Heiserian analysis. So. These different colors are different parts of the spectrum, and we can see that different things are arriving from different directions. Um, this, uh, I'll skip that one. Um, okay, so this little excerpt here, I've just removed. I've, I've removed the space, so the sound is here, and the these other channels that we're missing um, are the uh, the spatial part of the sound. Now the analyzer doesn't know what to do, so it's just making a mess. Uh, this this one here, uh, I've synthesized the space using some uh, uh, diffusion filters. Uh, and there's some modulation happening. So we can see lots of things jumping around and rotating around here. We're also hearing some filtering effects um, because we're only listening in stereo. Um, but uh, again, it's the same sound. It's just just this. Uh, there's been a synthesized space. Okay, this one here. Um, the uh, spatial aspects have been synthesized using a, a Heiserian uh, perspective. Now I've done this in a gross way, so all the everything's jumped together. But it um, you. Sh uh, I'll play it.
So we can still hear it's it's those ocean waves. The space just has been uh, resynthesized. Um, and this last version, I've taken the Heiserian uh, vectors and proce processed them. So I've, I've uh, removed detail, um, which groups everything together where um, the average weight was. Maybe that's the best way to describe it. So it's the uh, simplified version of the natural spatialness of the sound. Yeah, so in, in that example there, um, it's again re simplified and things are uh, clumped together, but uh, it, it follows the track of where the, the original sound material was. It's just everything is forced in a certain direction. Um, yeah, so we didn't really have a lot of time to sit and listen in detail to all these differences and what they might mean, but the... Um, uh, the point I'd like to make is this is the same sound. We've just touch the space, the spatial aspects in different ways and we get different results. And if we're interested, if we're an acousmatic composer, this uh, gives us a way to think about building uh, a piece of work uh, where the spatial aspects are fundamental uh, material to be uh, manipulated. Okay, well, that's uh, the end of the uh, talk and demonstration. So, yeah, thank you. Okay. Bueno, thank you very much for the talk and conversation. Uh, preguntas? Público? Yes, we have one. No, I have a microphone. When when you're talking about the the re resynthesis of the of the space, you, you mentioned the diffusion filters. That that filters what what they do? It's like rivers and delays, or, or what like how they work? Briefly, if you can. Oh, sorry. Thank okay. You. The very the very quick quick answer is the d diffusion filters here are like a kind of um, spatial snapshot of the the diffuse part of reverberation. So if you're in a wet hall, that very la last part. So it isn't really that, but that's the best way of describing it. Maybe um, hay un taller el día de mañana sobre Bisonics, eh, la superior de música. Tengo entendido que queda algún lugar por ahí para las personas que estén interesadas. Es un taller ya a profundidad que empezará a 8 de la 10 de la mañana y termina a 5 de la tarde, ¿cierto? Y es, es, es de todas estas técnicas y todos estos materiales para hacer este tipo de procesamientos eh, de sonido, ¿no? ¿Alguna otra pregunta que haya? O ¿Algún otro comentario que haya? Eh, ¿Hay? No, ninguno, nadie. Hay. I do have a question. Um, okay, we as composers are starting as a, as, a, as a generation or as a community to think that space is one of the variables in music. I mean, and it's a old, old tradition in doing all of these um, techniques for sound distribution. But in terms of composition, what have you found in terms of people composing specifically in these formats, and how does this format change the way that people is thinking the composition? That that's a good question. So, in in some ways, it's it's old days and it's early days. Uh, so, technologies are always changing, uh, which means we have new things to try and new things to play with. Um, so, you know, the um, if I'm just going to bring up an e example of Harrison again. So one of the things that, that Harrison is doing now, rather than composing for 
uh, stereo to be diffused. He's composing what I would call um, maybe something like diffusing for multi-channel arrays. So he he creates um, what we could describe as spatial stems, which are intended to go to different groups of loudspeakers. But uh, we could imagine that we have an array that surrounds us that is very near. So this can give us something very sharp and very close. Uh, or it can give us lots of um, activity around us and near. And then if you imagine like a target going back another couple meters, a similar array, maybe it has more loudspeakers, maybe less, uh, and compositionally uh, maybe there's a different set of material on that or maybe something jumps to that. So the, the notion still is there that there's a function of uh, or a spatial function, you know, so if we think a tonal function or a spatial function, uh, so, you know, it's the, so the tonic maybe is that pair of loudspeakers on the stage where we start and end there. Um, so, but one of the things that uh, Harrison is doing that's um, kind of a bit different, but it's, it's really an expansion of this notion of, of loudspeakers have a and space and loudspeakers and space has a function. Um, so I, I think one thing that's probably slightly new is that while stereo microphones have been available for a while and microphone position has been used uh, to create uh, recordings where space is functional, uh, 3D sound recordings haven't been so available. Uh, now, however, sound field microphones are hitting the market at a um, quite low price point, so people are getting a chance to, to do that. Um, and I think that's one of the interesting things is uh, thinking both in relation to the, um, the uh, camera and the projector. So there's space involved in both the microphone and the loudspeakers. Um, and we can set up what I would uh, call um, uh, multi-field arrays where we have uh, several interlaid ambisonic decodes that have a different function and they may be on different different arrays as well. Uh, so that's the, um, some of the concerts we've been doing in San Francisco are like that. So another announcement just um pardon el I una I'm I'm going to talk about your uh what I found a couple of days ago on iTunes that is the class that you gave so may I say that okay para las personas que estén interesadas buscando un poquito acerca de bueno los links me llevaron a los links eh Harrison tiene un um tiene un um una clase completa de más o menos seis horas que grabó en una otra universidad, no recuerdo cuál, pero está toda documentada en el canal de podcast de iTunes. Entonces, para las personas que estén interesadas en ver los detalles de toda la, la, la parte más profunda de esto, pueden simplemente buscar, buscar, I guess you, you, you use our Chambisonics en iTunes eh, course y van a encontrar esta serie de documentos y estos videos. And the, the access, yeah, the access to that is on the Ambisonic Toolkit webpage. Okay. So there's a link. Uh, there. Yeah. Bueno, pues si no hay más preguntas, entonces pasamos a la siguiente plática, ¿verdad? Muchas gracias. Thank you.